Here. 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 <laughs> Stay here, Steve. Stay here. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm John Fissner. I'm a parent of three uh, students, three boys in the district, uh, eighth grade Jack, sixth grade Dylan, fifth grade Ryan. I have a couple of passions. One's healthcare. I'm the founder of Able Pay Health, which helps people with out-of-pocket healthcare expenses. Uh, education. I'm the founder of Red Door, our early learning center, which we established for the community here. And lastly is football, which is a big passion of mine. Uh, I am a coach for the last eight years for Southern Lehigh Youth Football. Uh, turned last three years in uh, fifth and sixth grade level, which were 30 and one. Uh, we have a lot of excitement in the program on the youth level, and that is now working its way up into the high school, right? So today I'm here to ask for the support to establish freshman football at Southern Lehigh. Southern Lehigh is one of only 14 schools in the state. Uh, at the 5A level that does not have freshman football. Uh, from my perspective, there's a safety concern to have 14-year-old boys, many of which who haven't hit puberty, playing with 18-year-old men, right? Uh, some of those kids are obviously really established and they would move up. Uh, we have the numbers for the program. There are 29 eighth graders that played football last year uh, that will be moving up. There is a, and I talked over with Coach Sams and, and the team, there is a lack of coaching of those younger kids because the focus really is on the kids that are going to play on Friday nights, right, at that level. Um, we have, uh, in addition to the eighth graders coming up, we also have a bunch of backlog with seventh grade, sixth grade, and fifth grade, which has at least 20 kids currently playing football and the goal of football is really is to keep keep them engaged as long as possible right get them in get to the jv level the varsity level it'll shake out from there once they grow um you know who's going to continue to play who who is it i'm not sure of what the structure needs to be is this is a club level team if this is a another level uh just in the football program so that would be obviously for you guys to decide i know cost is is an issue uh, I've decided personally to fund the freshman football team for the next five years uh, to kind of take that cost off the table and uh, just kind of emphasize the importance to, to me that I'll personally put up the, the money. I do think this is an expense that the school should be picking up as we move forward, but I'm in a position to uh, kind of help that and get, get a jump started. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Ken Moore, and as you all know, I am your representative to Lehigh Carbon Community College Board of Trustees. I was unaware that you were going to act on our upcoming budget at your last meeting, or else I would have been there. So I'd like to be here because you made it easy on me that you all unanimously approved that. To thank you very much for your support, to remind you that this will be the 10th year in a row that we didn't have to come to the uh, sponsoring school districts and ask for an increase. Your share of the uh, tuition is uh, of the students' cost is 10.3%, uh, which is the lowest it's ever been uh, over the years. Of course, one third is tuition, one third is state, and the other third is supposed to come from the sponsoring school districts. Well, we've helped design a program that helps make that up to try and, and hold you a little bit, uh, make it a little bit easier on you on a year to year basis. As it relates to Southern Lehigh, particular, your share is going down $1,400 this coming year. So 
Uh, so in any event, that's always a nice thing. I also just lastly wanted to mention to you that I brought along a fact sheet, a demographic fact sheet for the year uh, 2022 for you. I just thought you might find interesting. If you have any questions, I will try to ask, uh, answer them or get the answers to you. Otherwise, I'd like to thank you very much for your ongoing support. I, I have Emily Gaiman here. I just have one comment that I believe this year at the high school, um, we've been able to take advantage of, you've helped us take advantage of dual enrollment and offering that opportunity for our high school kids. Um, and those credits, as you've explained to us before, are highly transferable because there are agreements set in stone with various universities as opposed to say AP credits or other credits you don't know are gonna transfer. You know when you're signing up for this that your credits are gonna transfer and who they're gonna transfer to. Um, through l -C, and I just want to thank you for partnering with our high school for that. that great opportunity for kids and a much reduced educational cost. Thanks. Well, thank you, and thank you for being so, know so knowledgeable about it. Mr. Moore, I just want to echo our gratitude for the partnership that we have. We have, again, expanded dual enrollment. We have a number of other um, irons in the fire. Uh, I do want to note uh, Dr. Bieber's strong support uh, of Southern Lehigh, uh, President uh, Bieber's uh, support of Southern Lehigh. Uh, she's been great to work with and, and hopefully before long, we'll have some exciting announcements about some more things, but for now, we're just grateful for the partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time and thank you for your ongoing support. Ken, I just wanna say, I we've talked a few times and uh, I know we're supposed to be getting you here for an update that was discussed, it just, didn't happen yet so i just want to make sure that you are aware of that and uh we are aware so thanks i'll make myself available anytime Get together. you're okay thank you so much have a good evening can i ask a quick question before because before we get away from it i am um, just regarding the football program just because i wasn't aware of a, of a difference, I guess, in our program as opposed to others. Are there known obstacles? I know Mr. Zimmerman, I don't think is here today, but I just didn't, if we could, if we don't know currently, if we could look into that to see why, or if anyone here knows historically why we didn't have one. I'm assuming there'd be additional costs because of coaching, potentially, if they're playing separately and practicing separately. Yeah, so some thoughts on it. There was a time, I want to say around eight to nine years ago, that the freshman football program was brought up. Um, some of the considerations that would have to be addressed are coaching to staff it um, and not spread it thin at the JV and the varsity level. The other thing, I do believe this is correct, that within the Colonial League, there are maybe one, but most likely none of those programs that have a freshman football program. Well, we wouldn't have any within the Colonial League, okay? There are many programs around us that have freshman football programs, but I don't believe any in the Colonial League. But I also believe that there's some changes, at least from what I heard anecdotally, coming up to the schedule, that some of the traditional programs like um, Salisbury will not be on the schedule this coming fall because of the change in size and the criteria. So what really constitutes our schedule that may be changing, maybe that presents some opportunities. I don't know. I do think it's something that, um, you know, Mr. Zimmerman can look at with the coaches, but I'd also be very hesitant to go into it and commit to it if there's not the, the coaching in particular and also it, that it's truly looked at as a development program. And, and that's what it's been talked about even in the past, but that's how it has to act. And, and development means if you do well in practice, you get playing time in the game and vice versa. So it's a learning opportunity, it's a development opportunity, and it needs to be managed accordingly. And those are just some of my concerns, but I think the bigger question is if there's gonna be a substantial amount of travel 
that's a cost and it's also time. And is that something that's sustainable over the long term? that we table this mm -hmm. discussion for our next workshop next month so we can get it on the agenda and we can have a discussion. You can all spend some time doing some research um, and consider uh, our visitors' comments and uh, recommendations. Okay. If, if we're going to table it and we're gonna, we are going to discuss it at the next workshop, okay. can we maybe put a bug in Mr. Zimmerman's ear and have him Absolutely. Give, give us some information on what he sees as obstacles. Yes, and it'll stuff give like a, that. I think it'll give the administration some time to get their ducks in order. Okay. Could, could right. I just, for in prep for that workshop, I just have one question I'd be interested in, and I don't want to spring it on in that workshop. I'd like to give the administration a chance to bring the information. I don't know how much funding a freshman football program would be. However, we'd no, we'd be covering all of that. I'm oh, sure. I'm, and I understand that, but my question is, since you increase. The spending, the district spending for a boys sport, exclusively boys sport, do we have to worry about balancing that with Title IX? That would be my only question. If we could also, could the administration, because I don't have a great understanding of that, if you could help me understand I think that. it would be helpful if we have comments or questions to email Dr. Mayen with those questions so he can talk with Mr. Zimmerman and get those things. We'll get this on the agenda, okay? Yeah, we'll, I think we'll, it's important. We, we will hopefully come ready uh, with a presentation highlighting opportunities and challenges, uh, and we'll be as comprehensive as we can and hopefully you know, allow the board to engage in a meaningful conversation. So that's a very good plan. Yeah. Thanks. Just, just real quick, just in preparation for that, could we ensure, because I know a lot, of, um, a lot of what we understand currently is based on retrospective data, but could we ask maybe some representatives from the youth program or Mr. Fistner again to come up and, and give uh, some information on right. current you know, current enrollment within the youth program, which I know is 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 blossoming. Right. Um, no, very definitely, sustainability in, in my mind is an important question. Right. Exactly. And, and not to, um, you know, rob from existing programs uh, that, you know, may, uh, you know, be uh, ba poorly, badly impacted uh, by something new. So all that will have to be part of our analysis. I see uh, Mr. Miller taking some notes there uh, and we'll be in contact and, and we appreciate the opportunity to have a little time to, to get our thoughts together on this to share with the board. Yes, uh, thank you, Mrs. Reinhardt. Uh, we have an agenda uh, before us tonight and what I thought I'd do, not really a, a presentation uh, per se, but I thought I would try to organize the discussion by putting together uh, just a few slides here. Um, so. Our first item on the agenda is college level, our college level exam program or CLEP. Um, as, as the board is aware, we've uh, made some uh, very focused efforts at breaking the barriers of higher ed for our kids. We have over 30 um, courses that are offered at Southern Lehigh High School that uh, are eligible for dual enrollment. We have another 10 or 15 or so that students can take for free online uh, through Mansfield University. Um, and, and we again have some uh, discussions ongoing to try to expand that. But there's, there's another way that students can get uh, highly transferable credit, and that is through testing uh, a test called the CLEP exam, college level exam program. And so uh, this is a program sponsored actually by the college board. Um, and many of us are familiar with AP exams, where for $101, uh, you can take a course, mandated to take the course, and at the end of the course, you have a pass or fail exam associated. And if you pass the exam, you get highly transferable credit, depending upon your score and the university you're going to. Uh, the, the real value of a CLEP exam is that if, if you happen to be, say, an American history buff and didn't take American history in high school, you could still sign up for a CLEP exam, take the exam, and if you are successful, end up getting credit. Uh, at a cost that is discounted from what an AP exam uh, charges. And so um, our thought is that participating in the CLEP, which is voluntary in every respect, um, gives us another opportunity uh, to provide our students uh, 
uh, to endorse our students who are taking college level work to get college level credit. And the, the it's it's not a new program, but our our thought was that what better place for students to take CLEP exams is to drive them to universities, right? Is to be able to take them here in our school, in their school in Southern Lehigh. So uh, we have applied and just within the hour, I think, uh, received an email to say that our application has been approved, that Southern Lehigh High School is now a um, recognized uh, CLEP exam center. And so our students can upon completing a class far broader than just AP. There are 20, 25 different exams that can be taken. Uh, they can sign up and here at their own school can end up taking these exams through a very well-defined secure process and end up getting credit. And, and we would say there's just another way, all right, that our kids can, can beat this challenge of, of higher ed. So we're, we're, we're very excited about this. We're very excited to have the news uh, for it. Um, and there's a link there if anyone wanted to click on to learn more about CLEP exams. So again, another step in, in the direction of breaking barriers for our post-secondary kids. Is this something that uh, students would be able to take advantage of this year, or is this something that we'd have to wait for till next year? It depends. There are some steps that we have to follow yet. Although we, re we did receive our approval, now we have to complete other actionable items. It could be, uh, I mean, we're definitely targeting the fall, um, but if we can get it taken care of sooner we will there are other items that we have to take care of now awesome. yeah yeah and and we know with a small smile that <laughs> southern lehigh high school is the only district in southeastern pennsylvania uh, that has such a designation and that's okay right uh, <laughs> is this just for our students or can uh, is there i, I think can, others yeah. can like Salis can students from salisbury come here to take an exam for I think that other school districts, we would invite them. And so long as we had room for mm -hmm. Southern Lehigh students, the, the more the merrier because we're all about, you know, doing good things for, for our community here, right? Okay. And with thanks to Dr. Trinkle and her team for um, managing the application process, all right? In another bit of news, uh, we have spoken at length about uh, unified sports here, uh, the, the implementation or the beginnings of unified sports. Uh, unified sports is a program sponsored by uh, Special Olympics. And the idea is that there would be a combination of uh, intellectually disabled and non-intellectually disabled students working together uh, to compete in sports, uh, which would provide opportunities that did not exist beforehand for um, our students with intellectual disabilities to compete interscholastically. And uh, so we're, we're very pleased to announce that we have been approved for a grant. Uh, and that grant comes from the PA Special Olympics. And the grant will allow us to um, purchase indoor bocce ball courts, uh, equipment for bocce ball uh, in indoor. Yes. Uh, so the and we're, we have the, the big news is outdoor. We know there's a big news outdoor. But um, the formal competitions for uh, bocce ball is indoor. And there is a, a, a court like there. They have like you actually construct a court indoors. If you can imagine roughly like these pipes, because you don't want to roll the ball and just have it keep going. So there's a pipe and there's markers. And then students would actually participate in a large court in these games. Um, and uh, there are a number or some schools in the region. I know Palisades uh, has, uh, does this and maybe East Penn, and we hope to grow this out more. Um, and so our students, because um, we're trying to get this moving quickly and because we have this grant again for a, a uniforms, a coaching stipend, for all the equipment we need and a number of other things, um, we'll be able to hopefully get this up and running this spring on an intramural level uh, and again, I think it'll be slow getting started like anything, but we hope to get some momentum for it. We're strongly supported by the Special Olympics who have committed uh, this um, funding for us. And so we're kind of excited about it. And also part of the program uh, will be to engage in school-wide efforts uh, to support inclusion and opportunity for all students. So uh, we'll be asking the board to approve the memorandum that defines the grant at our next meeting and just click on this and you could actually read the, the memorandum and its requirements. I have a question. Um, 
this sounds great. I didn't, I was unaware that we were looking to do anything bocce ball related inside. I thought it was all outside at the, uh, with the new stadium. Right. Um, is the, is Unified Sports covering all of our costs for it? Or is there anything that we have to pay extra to offer this indoors? Because we already knew about the expense for outdoors, right. but, but we, I didn't know that we were doing it indoors. Well, the, the, the idea is that our kids, once they get going on this indoors on a beautiful day, can go out on the field and we can invite other teams. So we'll definitely be playing outdoors. But this it is it's a, like a winter sport, so to speak. And so it's the, the spring. Well, ultimately, we hope to have a track and field team uh, where they'll be outdoors in the spring. And then in the winter, uh, this is typically the sport that goes on. But because we have this uh, new court at our new stadium, uh, we'll be able to do indoors and outdoors uh, for our students. And as far as cost, um, they are covering all the equipment costs, uniforms initially. Um, I, I would think that over time, we may want to have a coach uh, oversee this, um, which they are covering in the first year. So there, there could be added cost, but my sense is that the small cost of an added coach uh, would be far outweighed by the opportunities this would offer for so the, the thought by the administration then is to have a, let's say, a winter and a spring um, event of this similar to winter track and spring track, that sort of uh, concept. Is that correct? That's what we would we would see uh, bocce in the winter because it is indoors. Uh, the formal competition is indoors. And in the spring, particularly once we get our track in place, uh, we would like to see outdoor unified sports in, in the track events in the spring. So this will essentially then be like a whole new sport and like they'll have to uh, arrange for gym time like basketball or any other one of our sports. So this is this is like an additional winter sport that we need to start allotting for. Is that yes, correct? that is absolutely correct. Yes. Is it a winter sport or a spring sport? B Bocce is we're going to have this year. Right. It's going to be spring intramural because the, the PA Special Olympics would like us to get moving and we would like to get moving on it. Okay. But the spring sports will be um, the track, which will be the following year once we get our track up and running. The spring sports will be unified track and the winter sports will be bocce ball. And winter being when would it start? I think it would roughly overlap the winter sports season. Okay, so it would... Teams you'd have to find gym time away from basketball. Yes, we would. Okay. We would. Okay. I'm very confident that we would be able to do it. It wouldn't necessarily have to be at the high school. It could be any number of places. Um, and the, the, the actual facility is easily disassembled mm -hmm. and then reassembled. Um, it's not a huge amount of court space, although it is definitely uh, court space that has to be done. And I'm, I'm confident we could find ways to expand our, our program to include this, this group. Right. So, for example, you could probably set that up in the cafeteria as an example to eliminate some of the conflict or things well, of that nature. I mean, we could, we, we want other. them to be in the gym. All right. Because that's exactly where they should be. But as all of our teams take, you know, make compromises and move times and whatever, uh, I, this is the, that is the one aspect of this that does not concern me. We'll be able to do this. I, uh... is, is there a fall sport? For unified sports, I don't think anticipate? there is. No, I think no. it's just winter and spring. Winter and spring. Okay. Hi, hi, Gaiman over here. Sorry, sometimes people don't see me talking in the corner. I appreciate. It. Is there the good news about this? Is there the possibility? I attended the YMCA community meeting that was held in our high school auditorium the other week, and there was talk of because the potential new Y that will be going in on Preston Lane next to the public library is so close. I know one of the advantages of that, and they were talking about partnering with the school and having those talks, and I'm sure they're ongoing because they said those were upcoming, um, the representatives from the Greater Valley Y and this Saucon Creek Y. Um, one of those advantages or opportunities potentially would also be another gym space once it opens. And in collaboration, they're also supposed to have a pool. And so if we you know, can mutually support and collaborate, perhaps we are, as I think Mr. Lysette was alluding to, Gym space is at a premium in this district. Um, it's hard to come by and kids practice late into the night. And so perhaps in those talks and partnering with the Y, one of the things that you know could be explored is also additional gym space. Not I'm not saying to put unified sports in the Y. That is not at all what I'm saying. But I know our community 
uh, intramural youth basketball, for instance, uses that space a lot. And I don't see a reason why our intramural basketball couldn't utilize, you know, shared gym space of that nature. So it's another great community partnership that we could look into going forward if we have the addition of bocce at the uh, district level that we want in the gym. Just something to, to no, explore. We've had very constructive conversations with representatives from the Y. Um, we actually have a very rough um, document that would say we just intend to mutually cooperate where, you know, without any commitment. Uh, I had actually had thought maybe to put it on tonight's agenda, but I, it got to be a little lengthy. Okay. So in the very near future, we'll be able to talk about um, some of the very productive conversations doing exactly what you're suggesting is, you know, finding things that are good for the why and good for the school district. Great. Great well, to hear. I, for one, think this is a great idea, and I think it goes toward driving participation by others whom would never have been participating in the past. And if we can find solutions, which I think we can, can take this concept and run with it, I think it's an outstanding idea, both indoor and outdoor. It just brings more opportunity to students to participate. So um, I'm well, sure you'll you. come up with thank solutions. You. Thank you. Thank you. It is, it is about breaking barriers. That has been a, a constant theme, and I think this fits very nicely into it, as does the club exam. I mean, it really is something of a theme, I hope. So um, on to the calendar. Um, we have the 23-24 uh, calendar prepared for the board's consideration. Uh, the calendar itself uh, has been uh, all the Lehigh Valley, the Lehigh County, I should say, uh, that should be county, not valley. The Lehigh County school districts have uh, collaborated on this uh, with the reason that if we have similar schedules, then our students who go to the career center uh, won't be adversely affected if half the schools are closed one time and half the schools are closed for the other. That doesn't mean that the board cannot make whatever changes uh, it would like to take, like to make on this. And so, um, and, and this does pick up with the theme that we uh, incorporated this year of trying to have as much as possible limits on early dismissals or late starts uh, because of the impact it has on on families and childcare. So I, again, I just throw that out for the board's consideration. And our thought is that we would like to approve some version of the calendar at our meeting uh, later this month. So I'd like to make a suggestion that has been made before and got countered and tossed about, but we've never done it. And that is to make a true spring break week in the spring. And to do that, possibly we could take the 27th of November, since hunting now begins on Saturday. And it, it doesn't need to be the day for hunting as it traditionally has been in Pennsylvania. We could extend the school year by one day and possibly take the Monday after what is April 1st, put all three of those days into the week of the 24th and have a spring break week that might be very beneficial for the families and the students so just a i think though that doesn't that then um conflict with students that may go to lcti and uh because lcti has a set schedule and if our students are on spring break and they're not our students would could potentially be missing a full week of school at lcti well they'd miss three days if I'm following this calendar and they'd be <laughs> out anyhow. That's a lot. So that's a lot of days to well, miss. They, they, they'd gain back two of those days mm -hmm. by potentially being there the 27th of November and being there the 1st of April. And not if they're inside. I don't the think LCTI is open those they're days. Open. I don't think. Right. Is that, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to fight you, Bill. A spring break is something that everybody likes, but, but if we're, if we're looking to support our LCTI kids and kind of break down those barriers, that would be my concern. So if, if LCTI is open, they're not, okay. They are not open. Yeah. So do other school districts do that too then? I'm assuming then do other school districts in the Valley do the same thing then? The yeah, high the, school, because the, of the LCTI conflict? The, the Lehigh County school district uh, yeah. met all the okay. sending That's, schools. Because you mentioned LCTI. that. So I'm asking yes. It they mentioned to try to court, recognizing boards have their own, they make the decisions on this. But right. the thought was our, our, our initial foray to all of our boards would be a coordinated calendar for the purpose of the LCTI schedule. 
and they're open all the other days of that week and the following week. So there's no wiggle room with respect to pushing it a day forward or back. Do you, you see what I'm saying? Instead of yeah, the full and, calendar I mean, week. All but two school districts completed the same, um, with the exception of two, were pretty much in line across the board. They were just they haven't filled it out. Doesn't mean that it's not the same, but two school districts have not. Okay. Um, everybody else has. And we are pretty much in line with what that offers so that they're not in conflict with an LCTI is closed <coughs> when we're open and closed. Um, if we were to add the days that you suggested. What percent of our student body attends LCTI? I think we just answered that. I'd have to get that. Yeah. Is it on our little spreadsheet here from Ken? <laughs> no, that's, that's L Tri C. Oh, that's L Tri C. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. not LCTI. Is, I mean, if we don't do it for this year, it, it might be good to put it out to the families and do a survey to see if there'd be an interest. If there's no interest, move on. But if there's interest in it, it might be meaningful to do it. And, you know, to have LCTI control the district calendars across the valley, it doesn't make sense to me. Well, then you'd have to get all the other school districts together and have all of them band together and go to LCTI and say, hey, we all want to coordinate a spring break. Will you work with us? Not the other way around. You know what I mean? And like, you could certainly do that if there's interest across the families and the students to do it's it. It's not just, it's not our school though. You'd have to get all of the schools to coordinate. Well, what I'm saying is it has to start somewhere. So somebody has to take the lead if it's something meaningful to do. If, if nobody in the community cares, fine. I just know it's come up a number of times. And I know Jeff and I, in particular, not to throw you out there, but the 27th, we, we've always, of November, we've always wondered, you know, does that really need to stay there? Or could it be an education day? Um, I was always Oh, you were? <laughs> okay. Way but having said that, I, I recognize your point that no longer the first day of year season. Right. right. Yeah, when it, when it was deer season, it was meaningful. But I'm not, I, I, I'm not for the spring break issue, just FYI. I, yeah. I think and, and again, if there's not a majority of the board that has an interest in it, who cares? Move on. I just think it would be me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, and, I think there. it's come up. It's something that might be worth considering. And it, it would give students and families some time together where it wouldn't mean that they would have to be out of school. And they could have a week to do vacation, to do things locally as a family, whatever they choose. But it's something that there are a lot of districts across Pennsylvania that do a spring break and, and give the students the time. Mm -hmm. And they're working with, you know, technical schools also to find a way to do it. So I, Mr. Miller's here. He might be able to speak to the percentage of, L -trice, of LCTI students and other factors that would impact scheduling if um, if you're able to mr miller good evening everyone good evening everyone um some additional factors we run about 16 to 17 percent we do have a little bit of fluctuation with the number of students who go so we're roughly about 160 kids total with ampm and full-time attending the lcti at this time um, one of the biggest factors when we coordinate with the tech school is that when students go, they're required to get a certain number of hours, not just completion tasks, but a certain number of hours. So if our schedule would vary greatly against LCTI, we put a risk of those students not completing the mandatory number of hours they need towards accreditation to move from level one, two, to two, three, three to four, and then eventually be a co-op student their senior year for those four-year kids. I understand the, and this is, I don't have a stake either way in this. I'll do whatever the board tells me to do. I just know that we've always had that conversation with LCTI about making sure our students are getting there for the number of hours. Our travel to and from LCTI is a major factor because we are at the bare minimum right now with the number of hours. So our students are not getting behind in terms of task completion and towards their accreditation. So those are two major factors that we always consider um, and that we do let Dr. Trinklin, and Dr. Mayan know at all times. Um, but it's about right now, I'd say about between 160 to 170 students do go up to LCTI currently. What, what, Mr. Miller, what, what would you consider a substantial uh, difference? Like how many days of, of instruction? <clears throat> um, obviously when, and, and again, there's other factors that go into this too, because if at any point during a snow day, if 
50 percent of the other schools call off but we don't call off lcti will shut down but our students will still have a day and they will not make that day up so then our students are also missing additional time so we could end up having a school day and lcti mm -hmm. could not uh, we do have to work it around the fact that they do close a little bit earlier than us because of their own graduation to make sure their grades are completed for our seniors at graduation as well too so i would say if there's more than a two-day difference you're creating a substantial disadvantage to our students who go there thank you oh no you did i i just um i guess this is a question that i know came up last year too i i'm not opposed to having a, a full week for spring break i mean we do have five days if you include you know add them all up which is nice i do also think though that there's while I, I'm not like really beholden to the other days that you mentioned as being fair game, um, I do think it's nice that we have some scattered long weekends in that allow, I think, both kids and parents breaks. Um, you know, and sometimes it is enough to get a quick getaway in to see some family members or, or a driving trip at least. Um, so, I, I mean, I could go either way. I don't, I'm not opposed to it, but if, the, it sounds like the impact, um, and to me, that is a significant number of students um, that would be struggling unless we can figure out a, another way that they could somehow make up the gap. Um, I, I, I also think that sometimes um, it's difficult for either single parent households or dual working parent households to find you know, way, ways to cover an entire chunk or an entire week of childcare around, you know, the, the new year is easier because I think more businesses recognize that and you can, you know, I think that's, people are used to that. Um, but I don't think that spring break, break is as universally um, identified for that particular week. And so I think some of our families would probably struggle with childcare and, and that. Um, I do have, I was going to bring it up under new business. I had a question, suggestion. I don't want to derail the conversation now, but I have a thought about that might dovetail into this nicely um, regarding how we account for attendance in general. Um, so I, I plan to bring that up under new business just as a general question. Might might help the conversation. Uh, I, can I ask a question now? What I was... Okay, well then I'll ask it now. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, I was gonna say that I know because it's this time of year, it's like January, February, and those mandated 10 day um, letters for 10 days of absence have gone out to many families and parents new in the district, or even parents who are old in the district, you get the letter and it kind of sends a bit of a chill into your, oh no, I got this state official, and I know it's PA code, it's law. Um, if we're talking about breaking down obstacles that make education difficult and trying to help our community, both spend less money and perhaps spend more family time together. I was wondering, our current 10-day absence policy is absolutely state mandated. I understand that. But at Southern Lehigh, um, it's my experience that a parent could turn in, for instance, 10 doctor's excuses or 10 anything excuses for their first 10 excuses, whether it's a doctor's note that you got from an office or it's a, we had the sniffles or our family went to the zoo kind of a note. Um, but on the 11th day, regardless of which kind of note you turned in, our family went to the zoo 10 times, or my kid had the sniffles and I know he'll be fine tomorrow, or I went to the doctor for strep and pink eye 10 times and had to pay a copay every time, on the 11th day, each household has to present a doctor's note. Um, and it's my understanding that perhaps not all districts have that particular board policy. And my question was going to be, could this district consider um, waiting differently and giving credit for if I knew my child had strep or pink eye or the flu and I had to take him to the doctor and I paid that copay and I got that doctor's note, could we perhaps consider that in our counting of days of absence? Because that way, when I know my, have, my kid has the sniffles on day 11, I don't have to you know, pay the money and make the appointment if I've already shelled out all that money in copays. Um, and the way I think this helps, so could we could we count that differently? And I think other, other districts do. I think there's different credit given for, if you have 10 doctor's notes, you're fine. Go to, and, and some people schedule a spring break. So where this came up in my mind is potentially helping. Those families who are fortunate enough to be able to plan spring breaks and vacations and don't have LCTI students, um, very frequently they're getting those nasty grams in the spring that say, don't you dare take another day because you're at your 10 and every single other one after this has to be a doctor's note. 
people could just choose to say, I'm going to take a, you know, a nice spring break from my family and in the spring not have that weigh heavily upon them in the notes that they receive saying, you may not take a family day, you must only have a doctor's note. Um, and if that's not possible, perhaps we could, I know the language of that letter is also mandated by Pennsylvania Code, perhaps we could also rephrase it in a more understanding or explanatory way to families to help them understand that we're going to look at it differently or, you know, because family time and spring break time and mental health time is important. And parents who have, you know, you need to schedule your spring break to have, you know, reduced rates or you as a family don't want to give that up. So I think if we looked perhaps at that and being more f understanding of family time as a district and also considerate of co-pays and helping our community save money, I'd, I'd like to pursue that option. And you can pick and choose us, whether you want to spring break. Let us break. look at what we do and then maybe we'll develop some recommendations and come back. Great, thanks. Okay, can we do that? Okay. All right. And um, again, as I said, knocking on wood, uh, we've used two snow days so far. Uh, we have, uh, <laughs> yes, and, and, so, and so when the blizzard comes in March, and when the blizzard comes in March, um, we have, we'll use three remaining, and then any subsequent day, as was approved in the calendar last year, we're going to move to instructional days, virtual instructional days. Um, in the event that you know, the weather remains as it is this week, all the way through, um, then we will just continue to maintain school days, student school days on the schedule, uh, straight on through to, I think it's the 7th of June. Speaking of that, just uh, throwing it out there, one of our neighboring school districts um, for snow days, they <laughs> pick and choose which days are actually snow days and which days are flexible instruction days. They try to save the actual, like it's going to snow and the kids are going to get to go outside and play it at days for snow days. But like these nothing events that we've had that we've called off for, they've called them flexible instruction day. Well, no, you know what he I mean? Didn't, you know he, what she I mean? didn't mean that. She oh, didn't mean God. that. Yeah, yeah. You know they I were mean. totally necessary, Mike. No, totally. they were absolutely not. No, no, no. They <laughs> were necessary, but they... Kind. But there was no, there wasn't like that much snow out there to play in. Right. That's what I meant by the nothing days. Good Lord. Okay. No, I fully understand. So, all right. So, but then uh, you kind of, uh, the downfall of that is, is if they're calling for bad weather, you're waiting for the phone call because you don't know if you're going to have a flexible instruction day or you're going to have an actual snow day. So there is that kind of up in the air. But on the flip side, it does save those real you know, it's going to blizzard, let's get outside with these kids days for snow days. Um, just throwing that out there. I, I don't think I care that much either right. way. I'm just saying it's, it's kind of nice that way too. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's hard enough to predict the snow, not how much we're getting, okay. uh, which is even more, I mean, if it's a big storm coming. Um, and I've, I've called snow off and come back with a bit of a sunburn uh, having been outside uh, during the day. But the, the thought at least, is yes, we want kids out playing in the snow. Um, but the, the thought, as I recall the discussion uh, last year when we had it, was that truly we are focused on in-person learning and that we want to, as much as possible, get in-person learning in place. And so we'll run with in-person learning as far as we can possibly go. And then only when it comes to altering students, you know, graduation dates and that kind of thing, would we ever consider going back to the virtual instruction? So I think that is, I mean, and certainly whatever the board would like to do, we can. Uh, I would have no guarantees that I would get the accumulation snow days right from the FID days, but that aside, um, you know, our, our approach has been, we are really focused on the um, in-person instruction. Uh, I, I do think for your average high school student, a virtual instruction day, probably not that much of an ask for an elementary school child it's an ask of the parents because most likely a parent or someone's going to need to be there to help proctor the virtual day and i'm just i'm thinking back to a lot of conversation points over the last two years when we had virtual that you know parents quitting a job so one of them could be at home so that their child could be educated so Personally, if I never hear the word virtual or, you know, at home online education, again, related to elementary or middle school children, I'm perfectly okay with that. And if we just have regular snow days forever, that's okay too. 
yeah, I agree with you, Bill, about let's uh, let's have those instruction days be in the classroom. And I appreciate what you're trying to say, uh, Kyle, but um, I think when we call I wasn't snow saying days, that we should. Just, I was just saying that there's a different oh, option. Okay. That other, I'm, I'm, I said I don't really know that I care either way that much. It was just a, hey, this is how other people are doing it. I didn't know if it was something that we'd want to consider. Yeah, I'm in agreement. Avoid virtual days at all costs. I, let's not ever. If there's one thing we learned from the pandemic, it is our kids learn when they're with our great teachers and they're with each other in a school community under our rules in Southern Lehigh. And so to the extent that we can foster that with our calendar, I think it's a good idea. Okay? Right? All right. Okay. So um, health is, and on the pandemic, right? Um, the health and safety plan review. Um, we are obligated, uh, while this these rules are in place, every six months to review, not even vote on, just to review the plan. Um, our plan, uh, through its many iterations, now stands to ultimately saying, look, if there are mandates that come in that we, by law, must follow, we do. Uh, with respect to recommendations, that's something that the board decides going forward on its own. Uh, it doesn't automatically go in place. And, and and I raise this because, not that I don't think anyone is really watching this much at the Department of Ed or the Department of Health, but we are still spending for our construction and our language arts program COVID money. And at some point, I think an auditor is going to come in so to create the audit trail that we are looking at this. And certainly board members may have input about addressing the plan, but you know this is, I think, something that we need to do to check a box if at minimum, and certainly if there's substantive conversations We'd be very happy to have them. So there were no changes made to this. This is just reviewing what we have, right? Yeah. I, th I think with respect to posting online, uh, there might have been some minor changes. But essentially, nothing is changing with mandates will follow because they're mandates. And anything beyond that, we just simply come back to the board and the board makes decisions as you know circumstances require. So I, I, I do have a couple questions because I think there's a number of things still you know in this health and safety plan that we're we're essentially not doing, right? I mean, are we, <clears throat> here's a question, are we doing any physical dis distancing? Are we attempting to do any type of distancing? They're probably in the nurse's office. They're probably- I, I, guess, just, I guess I don't want our health and safety plan to say things that we're, we're, not, we're not doing. Yeah. It, you know. So I physical the, distancing the is one. Yeah. Are we encouraging students and staff to report positive cases to the school? I, I think anytime a student is sick, we would like nurses to know if they have the flu, if they have COVID, if they have so conjunctivitis. So yeah, we encouraging, okay. encouraging, not mandating. And and with respect to, to social distancing, we yeah. say our focus is on the learning and that we're not going to impart learning, yeah. but you know, certainly in the event of an outbreak of COVID or flu or whatever it is, to the extent that we can you know, try to avoid transmission, we would. I think that's just good practice. And I think the, I mean, I think it does allow for that flexibility, I guess, yeah. the way it's listed. I mean, it says modifying to allow for physical distancing, but it also says that our strategy is really that we're trying to promote learning first. So I, I, I mean, I see what you're saying, but I, I think it's okay the way it's written. Um, hey, are, are we, do we, are we updating a digital reference on the number of cases? That we are not doing. I think we have suggested a highlight for, to yes. change that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, there's a highlight for yeah, that. There's a highlight for that. Yeah. Well, I don't have time. Maybe I have an older copy of it. You know, the, um, the electric, Dr. Wayak, there, the electric, I'm sorry, the electronic version has some edits. Uh, perhaps, perhaps what there we gave you. Would there be are a couple of versions very, very out there. You've got to get the latest uh, okay. one. I, I may be looking at an old yeah. version. I'm sorry. And, and like, first, it's in the, in the distance of, of distancing. If we were in the midst of, a flu outbreak um, or norvirus, whatever. It is. We may say, look, let's not have a large school assembly today. Uh, and and so I, I think we leave open the prospect of, of doing some social distancing, but not to impact learning. Should, should I get that? Go to the Google Drives. Go to Google yeah, Drive and then uh, there's a word one. Go to share documents. I say, are we having technical assistance? I'm all for that. I have technical problems too. This does count as a mandatory. Any other comments or questions on the health and safety plan? Now go to share it with me. No, no, that's the one we got. The one that's highlighted. Thank you. You got the paper copy. Hmm. Okay.
Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Yeah, just for the record, in defense of Dr. Wayak, there were a few different copies with different date stamps. So that would definitely be that our was fault. That was understandable. That would be my fault for sending out the older, the older image. Yes. Well, let's get the no, perfect. Thank you. Yes, let's get the older one. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Again, yeah, that would be my fault in sending out. I, I sent out so many links uh, uh, to keep them track. Uh, that is me. Uh, so moving on. Um, the PA cyber resolution. And I think going to what we said before, if there's one thing we know, learning in person is how we learn best. Um, and the, you know, many public schools are often promote, uh, adopting, re school boards are often adopting resolutions for um, some supportive legislation or other types of initiatives. Um, and there's, I think, legitimate discussion of whether you should or not as far as the use of your time. Uh, I call this to the board's attention because I think there's about over 90% of the districts that have approved this resolution. And I thought, well, I normally don't bring any of this to the board because a wide number of people are doing it. Um, so I call it to your attention. And if there was a thought that we would uh, do it at some point in the future, we could easily add it. And if not, we could just move right on to the next, next item. But again, given that it's widespread adoption, I just call it to your attention. So a couple questions. Yeah. Um, is it cyber and charter school? Because when I clicked on the link, charter was mentioned too. Yeah. I mean, this resolution that was provided to us is uh, charter. Yeah. yeah. It's, in fact, more so charter than cyber charter. Yeah. I would suspect yeah. cyber yeah. charter right. would fall Which under is charter. It's used in a broad envelope. Yeah. And, and what is the impact on the cyber option that we offer? The impact? on cyber well if we're advocating against cyber school right now i think cyber i think charter is what this resolution is right okay charter. so it's so a cyber charter and, and, I don't and that's what i'm cool. trying to understand because when i looked at the link it was more much more about charter schools right. than it was about cyber schools and but here we're calling it cyber so I so it should be charter and cyber charter if okay. you open the link the title the resolution that was written up by Someone outside this district says at the top resolution calling for charter school funding reform. Right. Yeah. That's that's why I'm confused. Yeah. 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 Because on, yeah. on our agenda. Yes. It's cyber. Uh, can you. And, oh, I'm sorry. I'm on the computer so, so I can click on it. Just, gotcha. This is the one that everybody's adopting right here. All right. And I get I'm not saying that we should adopt this. I'm just saying that many districts have. And so, right. So is what others are adopting what was in the link that was provided? Yes. Okay. Yes. And it's charter schools, not cyber And schools. it is charter schools. It, okay. But in the first paragraph of that document, it discusses brick and mortar and cyber charter, cyber right. cyber but, charter but, schools. Yes. I know. The title of the resolution is like, but if you read the actual resolution. Okay. So yeah. the organized about this comment questions and comments about the resolution. I'm not in favor of resolutions in general um, for whatever purpose it doesn't mean anything <laughs> generally causes some level of division uh this is not maybe the most divisive topic but i, I think i'm not aware of i don't think we've got, i don't recall signing off on a resolution anytime that i've been here um and i'm afraid we're going to start signing off on other resolutions that yep. you know i got all kinds of good ideas for resolutions mm -hmm. that a lot of these people <laughs> that I, yeah i know dr Sreen doesn't want any of my resolutions um <laughs> no uh so i, I just think we maybe uh, um so for that reason, I, I just think uh, maybe we don't get into the resolution business and let uh, this is the Harrisburg issue anyway. We don't have really any authority over. Yeah, Jeff, uh, that's my recollection as well. And I know when you were president, it's, as when I was president, I think we both got hit up and, and many people contacted us and said, would you consider, would you make this resolution? And our standing board procedure was just like, no, no resolution. So that is my that is my understanding as well. So I, I, I agree with your your memory of history and the experience of there are a lot of these that come at us all the time. So, but it's up to the board. What would, what would signing this? Okay. What would signing this uh, resolution mean for either our district or for our students? Would there be a repercussion for, for signing it? I think there's little repercussion. There's a very strong uh, push for cyber reform and charter reform. And the people who are doing it would say, well, 100% of the districts have signed on to this, or 95% of the districts have signed on. So it's just a, 
something to talk about really it's just it saying no, hey, no, no direct impact it's just saying yeah we we don't like it so maybe we should saying, get yeah, our, we don't like our representatives who actually yeah. serve yeah. at the state level to actually change because that's, that's, that's really what's needed right yeah. It's a pointless exercise, so I, I don't see a need for it, and I, I think it opens up Pandora's box of what's the resolution of the week. So, yep. I was just going to ask, uh, Mr. Dimmick, a resolution from a body like this ends up being basically a signature on a petition in its full form, right? That's what it is, right? Yes. Move on. Yeah. I'm sorry. I would agree with you, Mr. Demick. I would agree. I would agree. I would agree with Mr. Deming. Yes. There you go. Yes. And everybody it, else's comments. Right. So I think we can move on. Uh, we can move on. If if we did approve this, it'd be my first in 23 years. So mm -hmm. I've not approved. I'm not. I think it's a good idea. But again, moving on. Uh, now we have. Uh, I think a pretty good. Uh, few slides here on technology. Um, the first uh, bit of discussion is that on hardware develop on hardware deployment. Uh, currently, uh, in grades K through three, our students receive iPads. In grades four through six, uh, we receive Chromebooks. And in grades seven through 12, uh, students receive MacBooks. Um, and so we are just engaging internally in a question about how do we best deploy our devices here? And uh, we did a survey of our uh, professional staff to say, you know, what is it that you use uh, and how would a change impact you? And I think the big difference is between a MacBook, which is an actual computer, and a Chromebook, which is more of a thin client. Uh, and so we've um, gathered that data, we're looking into it, and and we're, we're in the process of trying to develop some recommendations and engage in further conversation. But the one thing we do know is that our MacBook leases are not up for two years. And we spoke with Apple and they don't, even if we wanted to begin the process of replacing or selling the back early, uh, they do not have a new MacBook version out. And the current MacBook version uh, has had some real durability issues with it. It's known to have uh, problems with respect to screens cracking. And so we are going to hang on to what we have for the two years in that process. We're going to engage in conversations about how do we best deploy with respect to both functionality and cost, because you know, just by way of example, a uh, cracked MacBook screen can be $400 to replace. A brand new Chromebook itself can be $250 to purchase. And so, you know, there's there's economic issues, there's functionality issues. It requires a, a district analysis. We're going to engage in that conversation, but there's nothing on the brink uh, to occur, any changes in the near future. But I just wanted to alert the board that that's a process that we're we're undertaking. Okay. Is now, that all? Is that all leased equipment? All of it, um, or just it's, part it's of it? It's leased to own. So we pay. Essentially, it's financed, and. In the past, uh, there's been um, a, a sellback uh, to Apple where you get some resale value that then gets applied to a new round. So it's been like a, a, a cyclical thing. And so we want to do some present value calculations on how to get the best value um, and kind of do some things independently. We've had a little trouble actually getting the data that we want um, from Apple. Um, and so these are things that uh, we will be considering. But the nice thing is it's not urgent because we're not, we're not selling things back to buy the same MacBooks that have caused us trouble with respect to durability. You should make an appointment on the... Yes, that's right. <laughs> They're not going to help you unless yes. you make an appointment and show up at that store. Yes. But there, I did, in <laughs> all yeah. seriousness, there was... I also, I mean, I'm sure you've come across this too. I remember that we had achieved some degree of a deal per se to um, handle repairs, meaning I do remember from like a past workshop that, you know, kids could essentially do, not that this is an advertisement that you do so, right. 
but like do a lot of damage to it and it would be repaired at no cost was my understanding. But I'm sure there was a term limit of such yes. um, service, yes. so to speak, a contract. And, you no, know, very definitely. So we pay a, a, a substantial amount right. for Apple Care, which allows, I think, the first crack or two uh, to be repaired. The challenge that two, we're on two, right? I'm, if I'm, for the next slides, I could phone a friend, all right? Because <laughs> for any hard questions. Um, and, and so we need to calculate how much do they break, how much does it cost? The problem with Apple is that we can't service them on, by ourselves because you need to have certain certifications. We may have to consider that if we end up going with it. With Chromebooks, we can do it on our own and we actually are pretty quick at it. At, at a lower cost, but all of those things need to go into this analysis uh, mm -hmm. to come back with, you know, a true cost of ownership per se over a life cycle um, that we're able to define in reasonable terms. And so that's what we're going to be doing. In addition to engaging in conversations with our staff about the the utility and the differences in whatever it is we ultimately deploy. And then I would just have a question of. When it, it's usage in the um, in the curriculum in the in the classroom, are those utilities the same as a typical PC or laptop versus the Mac? Is it, for example, Microsoft Word and Excel, and are the are the other utilities that are educational maybe in in practice dual platform or are they just dedicated? Because I think that those would be some questions that may fall into the economic side of it and the usability and uh you know that net present value calculation right yes and so that was part of the utilization right. survey okay. so it, it may be it may be chromebook thin clients without the hardware um are sufficient maybe they're not maybe to get a computer a pc could be as functional as a macbook Mm -hmm. depending upon its operation and maybe a macbook is required or maybe a pc is required and so those are all the different um uh, like permutations of what yeah i didn't hear anything other than apple so i was just right. wondering if that was being addressed or not well if and it like, mattered i just didn't know and, and i think and like, an, another concern and is that youth graduate with dual platform skills yeah as they move on to university or another career after school, being able to manage multiple platforms is becoming very, very critical. So it's it's a little bit more than just the cost of the hardware, I'm sure. And it's confusing too because you we we're using MacBooks, but we're not use and we're not using Microsoft programs. We're using Google right. Sheets and right. Google Drive and you know, which is helpful I think in Google Classroom. So it's confusing, but I do I agree. It's nice that they're out there time here. They use different platforms, and they're pretty savvy. Yeah. I yeah. think by the time they get to secondary. Okay. Okay. Uh, one qu a quick question, or one or two questions about that, because that was a, a long discussion uh, way back when, when those were adopted. I do think, like, once you adopt one, it, it, I think for the staff especially, um, it, you know, it's probably a little tougher for staff to move away from one than it is for students, because we could always start students on a PC as opposed to an Apple, whereas um, a lot of what folks are using, I think, is staff-wise, has been created in and around the, the Apple universe as we've now been using that for a period of time. So just one thought about that. But I do agree that you should certainly look at staff and make sure that every staff that has one actually potentially needs one. Um, I can imagine there may be some staff that may, not, may or may not require a full MacBook. Uh, uh, and I do know that generally Apple's more expensive. But one other thing that's always come up, um, and my daughter's not old enough for me to know the answer to this, but I hear people ask me about the uh, the ability for uh, students to purchase their uh, Apple product from the, and I understand that currently, I don't think we can do that because we sell it back to Apple, but it looks like you're looking at that. But I have had uh, people ask me about the ability to, to purchase their computer at the end of their their, their time here, uh, so to speak, at a, you know, obviously a reduced cost over buying a new one or something like that. And uh, just a thought as you, as it looks like you're looking sure. at the, you know, how, how best is it? Do we leave it? give it back to Apple or is there some way that we can sell it and make uh, come out ahead or whatever. Right. So just a thought, I have had more than one person ask me about the ability to sort of purchase their mm -hmm. hardware at the end of the time. Mm -hmm. And first, let me say on the point of our staff members, we are absolutely of the view that staff members will need a computer 
not a Chromebook. All right. And I would guess. everyone who has an Apple computer, MacBook right now, no one is, they have it. Right. I tease, don't drop them. Right. But uh, for sure, no one is going to have their MacBook taken back. And, and perhaps to the extent that we need to replace them, we could talk to our staff members about maybe a PC or maybe a MacBook. So our focus really is not on our staff where we know because the numbers are much smaller. Right. And well, that, that's kind of what I wanted to hear. I and, think I think we'd probably be able to make more progress possibly in, in some changes. Well, in and, the, and the, the that's, that's the conversation. Okay. But, but clearly any staff member, and I've made this in all the discussions I've had, worried about having their, their MacBook taken from them to get back on the lease or – you know, if they break it, they'll never have a computer again. That, that that will not occur because we know our teachers are doing great work with their technology. There's great demands on them, and they need to have a good tool uh, to use. Uh, but in the same way, you know, there's not a lot of districts that are issuing MacBooks to their students mm -hmm. these days. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, you know, we are looking very specifically about – we don't want to disrupt the education. We, as a couple people got back on the survey saying, look, here's some very specific things I do in my class. And we would agree. Right. And so, you know, for computer coding, we're unlikely to say here, just take a Chromebook. All right. But for broader applications, right. Do we need a high resolution MacBook screen for everyone walking around doing Google, you know, Google drives and Google sheets, you know? So those are the things that we're looking at. We want to be thoughtful about it. We're going to be certainly transparent. We're going to be engaging in conversations, but you know, we're, we're going to, I think, come up with a good resu a good plan that will meet instructional needs and I think provide greater value to the to the school district. Well, and I think the key part of this is you're going to be speaking with staff to get their input, which is critical with this right. instead of just making changes without that. So, And we're good because we have a little time now. That's essentially the point. Okay. Now, on to some also exciting um, information about projects, right? So it's not only construction projects we're working on. We have some really good tech projects going on. Um, board, uh, so the, the we currently have about 10 various servers, all right? And these servers uh, monitor like IP addresses, internet traffic, our phones, our camera systems, our post office, uh, you know, stuff that we do. So we have 10 separate servers that handle those issues, right? And and one of the things that a lot of places are doing is they're taking these iron servers and bringing them together into a data center. And they're, they're developing virtualized servers where instead of having 10 different places, you'll have 10 different servers essentially inside the same machine. And that does wonders for... Um, computer maintenance, reduction of cost. There's, there's also flexibility so that, for example, um, we, through Mr. Suma's leadership, um, uh, are ending a very expensive service that we have used to try to help people not to click on phishing emails, mm -hmm. right? And so we will develop, instead of having a server where we do this on lot, do it ourselves, right? We will be able to develop a server within this new server all right, to handle that type of an application, just for one example, right? So this is a very, it's not a controversial thing that we're doing. It will be a long-term great value for the school district. And as it happens, all right, um, we, we found um, in storage, right, a, um, an actual, the actual machine that does this for us, right, the main server. Um, and so, uh, right. And so there's an HP Nimble data center, all right, that has been in storage and that it's there for us, right? And so the bulk of this um, will be covered by, we have the equipment there. There certainly will be ongoing costs. Um, we will need to get some uh, outside assistance that we have great internal capacity in our department. But in order to get this working up and properly, we're going to need to have you know, some consultant work with this, some labor. Um, but again, this is a project that we think we're ready to go with. And and we're going to ask the board to approve uh, this project later in February. And our hope is that, you know, we could have this completed over the summer. And this, while it will be a cost, 
it will save a lot of money and increase significantly the capacity that we have in our tech department. So, this may be great. an answer uh, question for Mr. Summa, but is the um, is the hardware storage array the Nimble system? Is that a is that a RAID system or is that something different than 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 that? Right. Okay. Thank you. And then, Mrs. Gaiman, you were seemed familiar with what was in storage. My question is, when was that bought, and what were we supposed to be doing with it? Um, I wasn't. I'm not tech savvy enough to be familiar with the particular system it was purchased or was in storage. But I do remember having various discussions about um, the fact that our infrastructure for technology, with the prior technology staff who is no longer here. Um, it was just on the radar of the, those infrastructure uh, was old and degrading. And I think we made jokes when we walked through the high school about this huge, like, looks like a 1980s computer kind of a thing. Mr. Mr. Suma is smiling and nodding. So we were aware that this was coming and there were plans being put in place about how um, to and how to approach this. But obviously, I mean, there was a complete turnover in tech staff. So I'm glad that you found that and are using the technology that was previously kind of discussed and planned for. And yeah, we, we were, I do remember the need for um, outsourcing part of this. It's a huge project. And right, Mr. Suma, it's a huge track. Yeah. I don't claim to be tech savvy. Okay, enough. No, I just wondered maybe when it was bought, <laughs> how uh, old is it? Not tech savvy enough to remember right. that, that conversation with the, to me, it sounds like a Nimbus 2000. And I know that's like, <laughs> that's the <a>, Mr. <laughs> right. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Okay, great. No, no, it's not. How That's did we ringing lose a bell that so there. Quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I'm glad. I'm glad you're. I'm glad, even though you had the huge. That's a huge. Won. Actually, it's a huge challenge to mention. Even though you had that huge turnover in technology staff, um, it's really hard to pick that up and keep rolling. So, thanks for thanks for using what we had and doing that. Appreciate how, it. How did we buy that in 2021 and not know that we have it? Well, I think the turnover in tech staff probably and the whole the whole. Department, yeah, it's quite the undertaking when you have that whole department well, go. That's a board approval for that too, I would think. Yeah, the cost of it. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, my only other question with that was one of the conversations that was had. I remember recall from those discussions is, um, and it's fuzzy because it was back what two years ago. The physical location of having one central hub versus multiple hubs. Am I recalling in different locations? Is there a, a safeguarding effect that goes into place? Because let's say I'm going to make something up, like let's say the room floods. So is there, I know one of the concerns back then was having multiple iron, whatever they were called. Great. Yeah. And for those listening, Mr. Suma just really nicely explained about a third party offsite backup in case of mm -hmm. catastrophic failure. So thanks for that explanation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So moving on to the second aspect of our uh, project, um, board members will recall that we experienced a significant failure uh, approaching a catastrophic failure of our internet uh, services at the start of this year. Um, in order to address, we, we made some short term um, adjustments. Um, and as a result, we're, we're stable now, but the infrastructure, the intranet infrastructure that we have um, is very much in need of upgrade. Uh, it is insufficient in number and it is also aging. So as part of this project, uh, we intend to put in 48 switches, which is essentially a router um, and 225 access points, which will, you know, uh, control the internet, uh, allow our students to access wireless internet. And we're doing all, and we'll have some uh, labor also to assist in this, a small fraction of the overall labor because we do have that expertise within our department. Uh, and all of this will go through E-rate, 
uh, which will allow us to access about 40% of the cost through federal funding. Uh, and so we have actually uh, put this out to bid through the E-rate process. We are anticipating uh, the bids to be returned to us on February 21st. Uh, our hope is uh, to compile the bids and come back with a recommendation to the board uh, in our February meeting uh, so that we can move ahead with this very much needed process. Okay, project. The timing on that implementation has got to be pretty critical then getting through the, the summer, right? Because it otherwise it becomes yeah. pretty problematic. Yeah, it does. It does. And so you know, our hope that we believe that if we can get this rolling in February, again, with the board's approval, um, then we'll you know, get right to work on its, on its purchase, acquisition, and implementation uh, in the district with the hopes of having it done over the summer. Okay. All right. Um, and then uh, we have some construction updates. And for this, I certainly want to rely on Mr. Pepe and members of the committee uh, for, for their input. Um, but as far as the ventilation uh, project here at the high school, uh, we're on the verge of going out to bid uh, for those projects. Um, we're very excited about it. Um, we have put out to bid uh, the intermediate school exterior wall project. Uh, Mr. Fred, do you remember when they're due back? Those? Yeah, the uh, brick the brick bids are being advertised uh, on the 8th was the first advertisement. They're going to be advertised again tomorrow and on the 20th. There's a pre-bid pre meeting scheduled for February 23rd at the IS, and that's mandatory in order to bid. The bid opening is scheduled for March 2nd with uh, anticipation to award the bids on March 27th. So they'll have to be reviewed for legal as well as conformity to the bid from the uh, professional uh, Dewey. That's, that's the schedule for the brick repair. The high school HVAC project is on a separate track that has a technical review of specs on February 28th. That's going out on advertisement for bids March 1st, 8th, and 15th. Uh, there will also be a mandatory pre-bid meeting March 21st for that project with a bid opening of April 12th. And it is our hope that we'll be able to award those bids on April 24th. Now, the first project has a final completion date of August 15th, 2023, as far as substantial completion, final completion, August 25th. So that's a project that should go off over the summer. The other project, although we're going to be bidding relatively at the same time frame, the substantial completion date on that project is August 2024. And that's predicated on extremely long lead time of equipment with the supply chain issues and it has to do with the chillers and the um, rooftop units. So those are the bid timelines. Right. And, um, and finally, on the stadium project, uh, we have a little handout here for the community uh, and the board. It's very excited to see the work going on down there. Uh, I do want to call to the board's attention that uh, we received word back from um, our permitting, from our land permitting, uh, that required some recommendations that required adjustments uh, to the construction of the basin that we're seeing constructed across the road down there. All right. And because of these uh, increases in design and increases in the scope of this um, basin that has to be constructed, we're looking at uh, a potential change order, a substantial change order uh, to adjust to this project. Now, uh, in looking at the design and looking at what was presented from our architect, we're not convinced that it is fully necessary, all the recommendations that were put into place with respect to the amount that's being expanded, the type of plants that are being put in, tarps on top of drainage areas. We think that a reasonable case can be made that the suggestions are over-designed. Um, we have been in contact with Athletic Fields of America, our construction people, and they are uh, of a similar mind and we have, at no cost to the district, through Athletic Fields of America, um, engaged the services of a construction engineer, an independent construction engineer, who will interface with those in charge of the permit, of the permitting, to say, hey, look, can we take another look at this? 
Um, do we need all that is in there to try to develop, you know, some better sense of control of, yes, we want perfect drainage, but we don't want to go beyond, you know, what is necessary to achieve those, that perfect drainage. So that's an ongoing conversation, one that will bring back more information as it becomes available. But um, it is still within the contingency that we developed. Um, if, if you recall, this process, when we did the value engineering, um, had some savings of about $600,000. This will eat into that savings for sure, but it certainly will be less than the $600,000 or perhaps substantially less than the $600,000 um, that we saved. So again, not, not the best of news, but it was not unanticipated that these types of things could come up. And again, this is not driven by enhancements to the project, but rather by uh, requirements for the permitting process for, for drainage. Can I ask a question? Thank you for the explanation. Um, would there be any impact on time? I know it's early and you're still getting more information. So I guess the expected completion date, if it is a more, you know, well, more obviously that work that needs to be done. The answer to that question is no. Okay, good. Um, according to the contracts that we just got back, the substantial completion is still August 7th, 2023. Mm -hmm. And that includes the field and the grandstands. Final completion is October 10th. Now we have made, or we were planning for any contingencies because you don't know what the weather is going to be like, right. or if we run into any kind of issues. But at this point, that's contractually wh what they are obligated. There's a thousand dollars a day for liquidated damages that's in the contract, which generally is utilized to help keep contractor on schedule. Um, we've been very impressed from the onset with uh, AFOA as far as their ability to be multidimensional. And as a matter of fact, a good example, with the wet weather that we had, they moved from the drainage basin to demolition of the bleachers, rather than just saying, hey, we right. can't work this week. So since they started the project, which I think they came in the first week, uh, actually towards the end of December, but they hit it hard the first week of January, they've been making some pretty good progress. We actually had our first uh, construction meeting on site and that went very well. Uh, we went through a number of items at the meeting and there's going to be standing items that are covered all the time. For instance, to give you a little flavor of that, um, we looked at the list of contractors, subcontractors, information to be disseminated in case something happens or like if, this, if the site's available but school's closed, we wanna make sure that they continue to work. We looked at um, updates on the construction permit, which uh, you know the superintendent just talked about. And Dr. Mann's correct that the initial change that we're looking at, it's a little unique because it's really not a change order, it's a design change order, which is a, a big difference. But the $350,000 that we were initially looking at, that was broken down over three areas. Soil erosion is the largest, which was $332,000 through the valued engineering, they're having their critical engineer, uh, I think they call them critical stage engineer, look at whether or not some of the uh, designs are over-designed as far as in order to obtain the permit. If they can, you know, if they can negotiate some of those down to where they're still acceptable for the permit, that number can come down. That's why we're not putting the number out on the agenda yet for, a, for board approval. Um, some of the other things that were minor, like signage, $4,700, and I think there was fencing in there, um, and I think the fencing was somewhere in the magnitude of $14,000, something like that. That was all as part of the permitting process in order to gain the approval from the township as well as from the uh, soil conservation. Um, as far as budgetary, we're still in really, really good shape because as Dr. Mann laid out, uh, initially, we were looking at a project of magnitude 6.8 mil. I think all, all total that came in somewhere around 6.2 mil. However, I set up a contingency off the 6.8 mil from the beginning. So that leaves us $680,000 in a contingency for the project. So even if it stayed at 350, they would still leave us a balance of 330,000 in our contingency. And that's outside of the fact that we're still ahead of the game on overall bid. So there's two different numbers out there. They just happen to both have a six in front of them. So overall bid, we started out about 600,000 ahead because we were out in front of the finalization of the plans. 
knowing that some of these things were still going to come up and we were going to have to settle up when we, you know, once we got there. Um, I'm a detailed person, so at this point I'll stop. <laughs> you guys can just, you know, fire away if you have any questions. I, I really appreciate that, that level of detail. I do have a question, though. Um, if that contingency, so based on that, I understand the contingency, which is great. Um, what happens to that amount if, from some magical reason, which is doubtful, we would actually not need to use it for this project. Mm -hmm. The reason I ask is, um, and I'm going to bring it up again, um, I keep asking whether or not we can start looking into how we can also bring some improvements to our performing arts program here. And I was struck um, as I walked in, you know, the musical is, yep. is, is practicing and I could hear them and I stopped in. It's, it's beautiful and our kids do a great job with what we have. We've continued to expand. I know at the IS and the MS levels, we have fantastic um, leaders within our music program when it comes to instruction and it's really, really building up a program um, which is already known. So I just, you know, I, I keep bringing it up and I understand that we um, don't have anything concrete at this time because it would require um, cost, design, what have you. Um, what I would ask is for two steps, you know, rather than me just asking for something to be done, um, perhaps if I just asked for concrete steps, which I'm just thinking about as I speak, so bear with me. Um, one, could we, again, I know we went through this process, so we probably already have the notes, so you don't need to reinvent the wheel. When we were looking at the initial construction plan with the Performing Arts Center, um, input was obtained at that time, I remember, from teachers, you know, STEAM, because the STEAM program and the music program, I know input was obtained from them already with respect to what their needs were. And if we could at least look at needs that could be addressed, you know, without such a, you know, such large mm -hmm. steps as building a full on performing arts center. Um, that's one, you know, two, I would like um, to hear some feedback, if possible, in the near future with respect to collaboration and partnerships in the area. We have a lot of universities that have facilities. We already perform at some of them, like we perform at Zollner. You know, maybe DeSales would be would be willing to um, partner with us. I mean, I know they have an active program, but maybe there are times of year it's not as busy. Just to give our kids an opportunity to perform on stage, even the younger ones, because having those types of chances really will continue to promote, I mean, it's similar to sports, right? Like we're talking about a freshman football team. Um, you're, you're building that interest and, in, and by, you know, taking a smaller group and really working on their needs. It's similar, you know, with performing arts, I think. So those are just two suggestions. I know we have a lot on our plate um, and the, your, so, the facilities committee, yeah, you guys are try, doing a lot. Let me try and answer your question because it's a good question. So first of all, anything that's left on the contingency for this project or any other project would revert back to capital reserve okay. if we had if we had intended to pull for that project at a capital reserve. If you remember, we were looking at the uh, facilities loan that we were taking the bank note for eight million to cover the majority of this cost as well as some other projects, depending on how much is available. That would be the first address to put more into one of the other particular projects and try not to pull out a capital reserve. As far as long range facility planning, one of the things that we did is we took that analysis that had already been done and we started to prioritize what some of the immediate needs were that got pushed out in front of some of those projects. Correct. So what would happen, my, ex my um, expectation, I believe the facilities committee Dr. Mann and I look at it the same way as administrators is as we get through the projects, we're going to reassess where we are and now what is the highest priority. So if we have our infrastructure all buttoned up, if we have our, you know, windows, doors, roofs, uh, you know, siding, in this case, brick repointing, HVAC, once those items are addressed, then we're going to come back and look at, okay, now we're in a much better place. What's next on the agenda? And that will certainly end up being a board discussion before that's finalized. Yeah. And I would say beyond that, certainly Mr. Pepe is correct as we're talking about larger projects. But if someone had a great idea to go to the sales, right, that doesn't need a capital. Pri and there may be reasons not to go to this, but whatever. And I know I take your point. Absolutely. Whatever it is we can do to make things a little better. Sometimes that doesn't even require that much money. 
And so, um, you know, there's a very strong desire to build upon the great things that are happening. And, you know, large scale construction stuff is hard, but sometimes smaller things that are meaningful are far less hard. And just one more thing before I wrap my part up. This update is indicative of the updates that are going to now come out periodically as we have, you know, more information available or, you know, important milestones reached as the project begins. This will end up appearing on our website so it's accessible to the community, but we wanted the board to see it first tonight. And I made some extra copies that I will put up here if anybody would like one on the way out, they can certainly pick one up. Thanks, Mr. Pepe. I had two questions um, that you brought up, and I agree with Dr. Shreen. Thanks for all the detail. Um, when you mentioned with st stadium completion, you mentioned substantial completion of August 7th, I believe, and final completion October 10th. Could you explain the difference between substantial completion and what, like, what are we missing? Is that going to be something where our students can utilize the facility or the community can utilize the facility? At what point? during substantial versus final completion? What does what do those two things entail? Yeah, usually substantial completion means the project is pretty much ready to go. However, you have punch list items. Right. And a lot of times that'll be determined on final completion. Um, a, a project of this magnitude, we're gonna have to wait until we get to that point to see how much usability we have at, at uh, August 7th. Okay. Uh, obviously the desired intent was to try and prepare so that we could start utilizing for fall sports that would start in September. Right. Whether or not that's going to happen remains to be seen. However, our athletic director has already been working on alternative plans should there be any delays to that. Okay, thanks. No, that addresses my question because I didn't know whether that you could utilize the facility at all before final completion, but I'm glad to hear that there are other plans in place just in case, contingency in case. in the later stages of substantial completion, you can use the facility. Yeah, That's yeah. It's just a matter of that timing, and I know yep. you can't you can't delineate that now. Thanks. Um, totally understandable. And, and we also will need to get a certificate of occupancy before we right. can put anybody on the field. Right. And that's a safety measure. Right. So, you know, it's, it's a little early at this point to see where we're going to be, but that's just what's in the contract. Okay, thanks. And my other question related to um, completion when you – and you – clarified those dates for IS brick, brick completion and um, high school HVAC completion. And I believe you said August 15th and 25th for IS brick of 2023 and completion for the HVAC. We were talking August, we're still talking August because the work's going to be done over the summer, but HVAC we're talking August 2024. Right. Um, and especially the HVAC, I know you've talked about, I've been to facilities committee meetings where you've talked about the lead time and the delay in those materials is what's causing that. Um, is there a contingency plan? Are we concerned about, I mean, August 24, 2024 is a long way out. Are there any concerns that we need to plan for with contingency since it's HVAC? Um, or is not that something, I mean. at this point, it's it's a little too far out. Okay. You know, I, I think at this point we're reliant upon the uh, project schedule that EI has put forward based on where they believe uh, major components of materials to be. Okay. I think they build in, you know, the um, best case scenario at this point. I, I don't think that they would give us a date that was something they didn't feel was achievable. If uh, delays continue or expand, I mean, we never know what's going on. I remember one year hurricanes were so severe down in Florida that it impacted supply chain on equipment throughout the rest of the United sure. States. So something could happen between now and then. But at this point, it is what it is. The equipment is up there that's up there. And if we don't eventually replace it, we may come to you and say, guess what? We have no air conditioning because the chillers are no longer functioning. Right, right, right. And I'm not as concerned about the IS brick because although it would be an inconvenience, it's an external kind of a thing. And so completion for that, to me, the HVAC stuck out. The last thing I have is while we're talking about 2024 timelines, I do remember attending facilities meetings and there's discussion about, um, there was an expert brought in a while ago, I think, I don't know, as far back as maybe June or May, um, talking about because we thought perhaps the district had a roofing, you know, budgetary concern, and that report was good news overall because the roofs were in able to be patched or managed or in better shape overall. But I think I do remember that um, the one roof that was of first priority and particular concern was 
Liberty Bell. And since we're talking about 2024 time frames, um, I believe there was something discussed there. The expert said, consider changing, I mean, looking at doing that in the summer 2023. And the conversation at that point was that, you know, the because of materials delay similar to the state fact that just wasn't, you know, feasible, we would have had to start bidding that well in advance. So since we're already talking about each VAC 2024 dates, what's the planning horizon on Liberty Bell roof planning? You know, because I know that was couldn't be done in the summer of 2023, which was kind of the recommended, like best, you know, not even best case scenario. The, the I remember the expert being pretty clear in that. But what are we looking at with Liberty Bell roofing for 2024? Yeah, basically the findings from uh, Mr. DeBuno and the uh, Thanks, I the, forgot the name. Yeah, and from SR Products and the uh, analysis, the infrared analysis, nothing's changed since we got the results. When I talked about prioritization, right now our time is really more spent on the HVAC project and the brick repointing. Okay. Once we get those projects in place, we will come back and determine whether or not we want to advance a roofing project either in next year's budget and or the subsequent year's budget. Nothing's really changed much. Okay. And as he said, we're, we're not experiencing leaking. The issue that he's concerned about is, is really not going to change much between now and next year, but we're going to continue to come back and look at. Yeah. I remember, I mean, he wasn't so much concerned about leaking as that envelope. We talked about condensation and layers and Correct. water building That's up kind of a is. thing. Yes. And um, just with that water, you don't know from one day to the next that condensation and extra weight, you just have to monitor it. But yeah. that was the concern, not an actual leak, kind of that no, build up true. between layers. I yeah. think to look yeah. at the, at the overall view of this 30,000 feet, Mr. Pepe and the uh, business department of this um, administration has been putting together a, a very thorough and prioritized list of any and all facility related issues throughout the school district. And with that priority list, you'll be working with the facilities committee to look at next projects. And that, that was a critical thing to put together so that we have the visibility that you're talking about with respect. Yeah. 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 Liberty Bell is Liberty Bell roof is stable. Um, it does require, will require some work um, to the extent that it becomes unstable or leaking. That is something we will jump on. Correct. But I will also say that there, we are now at our bandwidth when it comes to managing projects as an administration. And so to the extent that anything comes up that needs to be fixed, it will be as quickly as possible, but we are not prepared at this point to address additional uh, projects because simply we demand that we have high quality outcomes for the projects that we have. Right. I, and let me just say that, you know, with regards to these projects, they're complex and big. We've got a lot of moving parts to it. And Mr. Rohrbach and Mr. Pepe are working to ensure that we're proactive and to your point, Dr. Mahone is the uh, being overloaded from a resource standpoint with all these moving parts within these two major projects, not to mention the third of the HVAC. And, and the last thing I'll say to close this part of the uh, conversation, health and safety is number one. So if the project became a health and safety issue, it would be escalated and moved on regardless of how many projects we're managing. So that's, yeah, that's good not, to hear. That's yeah. not ultimately, that's not our concern. The reality is based on our uh, evaluation of all projects and kind of going back to um, your question, Dr. Serene, I actually worked with uh, Mr. Rohrbach to take the facility assessment from the prior architectural firm. And we went through every element and broke it down into a prioritization basis and added uh, potential dollars to it. So from a cost impact, we're not avoiding the project because we don't have money to cover the cost. We right. do. And when we feel that it's the right time to put that project forward, we will. If for some reason we, we found that the condition deteriorated or changed to such a point that we need to take care of it now, we will. So I, I don't want the board to think we're not going to take on an additional project. But at this point, our time is, is spent on the critical three projects that we are running. 
and we don't have that one on the uh, on our agenda at this point. Okay, <laughs> six months from now, things may change. Yeah, yeah lead thing, time was the only thing that brought it to mind because yeah. I saw twenty twenty four, and you were talking about age check, and I just remember twenty twenty four was. I was just you know. And the, and the other thing too is whenever whenever anybody comes out to do analysis. Mm -hmm. I also have to consider, you know, what what they're promoting and or what the potential end game is, because the materials end up getting work for them. So yeah. I'm looking at what's in the district's best interest. Good I think to hear. The, the important thing to note, Mr. Pepe, <coughs> is that you and Michael have gone through the existing materials that a lot of money was invested in, and you've put together a prioritization plan and schedule, and you're working that plan. And that's not to say that there couldn't be contingencies and surprises along the way, but you have a plan in place and through the roofing review and other reviews that you've done, you have a pretty actionable timeline of when things need to be addressed and now putting cost against it. It's a very different place than in my perception we've had with facilities for a decade yes. where things were peace mealed together when they became more of a surprise and our administration and what you've done is look at everything that you had get some additional insights from professionals which very much appreciate that approach and you now have a plan and, and you know there are things that i'm even thinking of right now from the kcba work that came up about the auditorium mm -hmm. that might be a little spends but meaningful right that we could do. Um, and that's something that I think in, in coming time, once we get through this bidding process, we get through the initial phase where I think we can gain a lot of time or lose a lot of time on the stadium project. Um, we'll be able to kind of put more investment in some of those other things, um, including the roof, but also the auditorium and, and other types of, you know, planning for what we could do right. with monies as they become available. And yeah. I can't emphasize enough what this administration and the team that Dr. Mahan has built and the value it gives us in terms of really being able to address facilities, education, and everything else and, and kind of put Southern Lehigh back where it should be and needs to be but also have buildings that our students can be in that don't have drips and buckets and everything else throughout the classroom. Um, and, and also have facilities that foster more of the creativity, even when it comes to the auditorium. So hopefully at some point in the next decade, maybe we're building a new auditorium too, but <laughs> and, that and may be a big decade. step. So and I, and really I understand quick, too, one okay. last, one last yeah. thing that does happen in the district each year is an annual evaluation. And if you remember, a couple of months back, we appointed EI as uh, architect of record, which also gives us access to structural engineering, uh, electrical engineering, and other components that when they come through to aid in that annual inspection, that's when we turn around and say, okay, let's have the conversation about the roof over there. You know, what's the condition? Has anything changed? Do we need to move it forward? If it's stable and it's in the same condition it was in, when the initial reports were done, we may push it another year or whatnot. Um, excuse me. So I really appreciate all the work that you have put into this because I do, you know, finally understand a timeline and, and I like that things are marching forward. So I, I don't have, um, you know, any qualms that it won't be brought up in the future. I just want to maintain it on the radar. So perhaps, you know, how we kind of slowly started talking about, okay, the stadium, we started working on it. We have that process moving. Then we started talking about what was needed next, which was HVAC and the, uh, the bricks at the IS. What I'm hopeful is that we can start to have conversations and be brought up perhaps at workshops, things that, you know, potentially are easy um, first, like line items that we could kind of check off. I mean, even things like in, in going to performances over the years, um, sound system, mm -hmm. having more mics, the ones that come down. I mean, obviously we didn't do anything because we thought we we're going to have a full mm -hmm. on new auditorium, but that's not happening. Um, I think anytime soon, realistically. So, you know, I, you watch the, the band directors are kind of chasing soloists with the mic. 
Um, and sometimes there's only one and it has a really short cord, um, depending on the school, you know, just like little things like that, where, you know, like kids who have worked really hard and want to show off to their families, it's, it'd be nice to be able to hear them. Um, so little things like that, maybe if we could just start to hear about things like that, obviously the larger projects are going to take more time. I get it. Um, but thank you. And we're talking about things at the high school because that we were kind of talking about that large arts performing arts center that isn't coming to fruition anytime in the near future. Um, and in addition to, to that, like the theater that you just mentioned, they're, they're, they don't have enough mics to mic the students performing, and the mics they do have are very old. So I think that would be actually a great yeah, I mean, project. That's, a, that's that, something that I think we can work on. Yeah, yeah. and that would benefit all students. Okay, okay right. folks, I think, you know, this goes back to the planning process and talking with staff MJ. in those departments who really have firsthand knowledge of what some of those immediate needs might be that would improve things incrementally. So if anybody like else who hasn't, my thought. I just, I just, that my, that was my half thought. I, we need to have any new, any new information, any new questions or comments. And I would MJ, like to finish, finish my thought. She, it, it, you interrupted her in the, right in the middle of the sentence. We are being redundant. So under Robert's rules, I'm asking for the board members to contribute new questions or comments. This is a new comment because it's the second half of my thought. Okay. The first half was addressing secondary education at the high school and middle school levels with mics. The second half of my thought was in a cost saving efforts, for instance, at the elementary schools, Hopewell, we need to look at those facilities as well. Because for instance, Hopewell doesn't have a performing stage. They have a gymnasium and a music room where the wall slides away and the kids stand on a flat floor to perform. Um, that was a cost savings measure that was taken when that building was built. I, I wasn't around then. I'm not sure the logic, but if I do not want to ignore because we are in the high school building and we're close to secondary schools, I do not want to ignore the arts needs of kids in the elementary levels as well. And I would ask for projects to be considered for those as well. And I think those are all really great points. And if you have ideas, I would suggest you um, send Dr. May an email, give him a call. Um, or talk with the facilities committee members directly because we're getting a little detailed here and we need to move on. We have more on the agenda, but thank you, Emily. Okay, with that. Yes, uh, we could just conclude, and I think briefly with policy updates. First, I want to mention that Mr. Pigeon has a long standing commitment that he was unable to make tonight and he sends his regrets. Um, the current batch of policies on the are separate and distinct from the ongoing effort uh, regarding the comprehensive policy review. If you remember, uh, we did the zero hundreds, the zeros the last time. We're waiting for the one hundreds. Uh, that process is separate. PSBA also will occasionally send out updates when there's a change in law or a change in some type of, of uh, you know, direction from the Department of Ed to update current policies. And so the policies that we're looking at now are simply small updates to allow for uh, our policies to be in compliance with new laws and regulations. And the, the changes are very small. Now, I will also say that when the 200s come up in the comprehensive policy review, we will look at them again in greater detail. But for now, there are very minor changes to reflect statutory changes. I put them just very quickly, 202 enrollment of uh, homeless students, uh, or 200, 202, enrollment of uh, homeless students absent documentation. For example, the new policy says if a homeless student comes by and doesn't have the documentation because they're homeless, enroll them anyway, right? So, I mean, they're not, these are not really big updates. We'll certainly look at this in detail when the 200s come rolling in. My point is that uh, these policies are not uh, heavily detailed, and I think a scan of them. Uh, by board members should put us in a good position to have uh, an approval first reading uh, at our meeting later this month. Obviously, if between now and then there are any questions, just send me an email and we can, we can sort of look at it. But again, I don't, I want to de-emphasize this because we're going to be looking at them again before too very long. I have a procedural question. Can we have first readings at workshops? Um, we certainly could uh, have- For policies. We certainly could have readings, first readings at workshops. We just noted on the agenda. 
right. that we okay. put out uh, you know, a day or two in advance. I think that might facilitate things. And it, for tonight, we could have, I think, reasonably had a first reading of these. Mm -hmm. And if in the future that's something the board would like to consider, we can certainly accomplish it. Thank you. Okay. And so Are there any comments or questions on the policies that were presented? I just had a quick comment on um, just because it, it's referenced um, throughout a number of policies uh, in the 200s is the, uh, to your point, uh, Dr. Mayen, um, students experiencing educational instability. And then that's not generally defined, but it is defined in uh, students experiencing homelessness, foster care, and other educational instability, 200 pupils. Um, that one does define it. And it defines students experiencing educational instability uh, means a student who has experienced one or more of the following, and then one of them is homelessness. Um, I just thought that was poorly drafted. Um, to define experiencing education instability uh, by homelessness, because I don't understand necessarily, I think I have an idea of what homelessness might be, um, but I would suspect that there could be different definitions of what homelessness is. Um, yes. So I'm a little surprised that PSBA it isn't more definitive in, I mean, I can see parents, I can see potentially people claiming home, homelessness in a different forms yes. of the word. And I'm a little surprised that that is a one word, literally one word definition. Yeah. It doesn't have anything more than literally one period homelessness um, right. to define educational instability. Um, so I think um, it would be helpful because I don't want to see the, the district get itself in an, in an area right. where, um, you know, people people have different ideas of what homelessness might be. Right. Homelessness is very broadly defined and well defined under McKinney Vento Act. It's a federal act. Okay. And so we do have a, a very rigid operational definition of homelessness, and it is very broad. Uh, so, for example, someone who uh, has a rent problem and has to move on a temporary basis would be considered homeless. Um, a student moving from place to place. So th th it is very, although it's certainly not well defined in the policy, it is certainly, it is very well defined under federal federal regulations. Maybe we could tie it to that then? Yeah. Or um, that would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, that, that makes more sense to me. Um, but I had some concerns about that. I also had, um, and I know you said it's not a first reading tonight, but just uh, in case somewhere down sure. the line we... Um, there were some pretty substantial changes to um, folks being able to stay in the district after they may have moved out of the district. Um, a one year yeah, I time frame, get, I yeah. think, on that. Yeah, one was like they wiped out every option <laughs> except for the entire school year. Um, I saw at one point a semester marking period. Um, well, but they were taken away with my reading and, and left mainly with just uh, the one year sort of the longest guess, version. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, I think so. Probably. I'll be yeah, it was 202. Yes. Yeah. You're right. 202. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I think there's some options that do remain if I'm looking at the same place. And those are the, the questions that we will be answering when we do the formal review of the 200s, Mr. Deming. So, yeah, I just said, uh, right, they wiped out a number of, I mean, there had been about five or six options there, and they took out about half right. of them. Yes, semester, um, marking period, and payment of tuition were all removed. And then remaining would be school year payment of tuition, all of which we would intend to uh, ferret out when we do the 200s uh, in our normal review. So this revision is from PSBA's recommendations, but how will we see that when we go to do the 200 reviews if we make a change now? Well, just as we did... PSBA would be anticipating us to incorporate these. So when PSBA sends out their updated 200s, right. um, these changes will be incorporated. And just as we've had with the, the, it will be the same process as we did with zeros, the zero hundred, okay. uh, where we'll have the cross outs, the red and the different. Uh, so you'll be able aspects. to see the process. So you'll be able to see the process. We'll use the same method as we did with the zeros when we get to the hundreds next and the 200s all the way through. 
Thank you. Just one very quick thing in 202, I didn't see anything in reference to, and I don't know how this is handled, but for foreign exchange students with eligibility, I don't know how that works within these policies because I assume we have those still and have had them. I think the district can, and I think it's a separate decision, but the in order for a <clears throat> an exchange student to come here, we have to give permission for them to get a, an educational visa. Otherwise, we would not anticipate seeing them. If a, an exchange student somehow lands here without that visa, but they're living within our district, we have an obligation to provide education to them in the same manner as if it were a you know, district resident for 100 years. This is one quick comment. Um, if we're going to be voting on first readings during workshop in the future, potentially, I think we should probably consider having our solicitor here to answer questions because we frequently have many questions the first time we're looking at these policies. And I know in the past, she's often saved us time when she said, well, we have to say it this way. It's PA code or she's explained a definition. So if we're going to be voting on them in a workshop setting, our solicitor doesn't attend workshops typically. So I would just ask that perhaps we consider that change as well. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments on uh, policies that are presented in the agenda? All right, with that, we are looking at any post-meeting visitor comments. You can share something about the Super Bowl, Tim? Or... <laughs> I'll talk to Doug, Doug privately. All right. <laughs> Steelers didn't win, I know that. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right, um, early happy uh, uh, Valentine's Day. Yesterday was International Day of uh, Women and Girls in Science. I hope we do all that we can to encourage STEM, especially for our girls. Robotics Club helps a ton. Counselors, last week was School Counselors Week. Thanks to all who support their work. Free CDs, um, free for any Southern Lehigh School District employee. If there's any administrators who want to bring it to their uh, staff room, I want to get rid of them. I've had them for a couple of years. My students, especially like the um, Children's March, they could relate to it. So I'd, if anybody wants them. Freedoms Foundation, free scholarships and credit hours for our teachers at Valley Forge. Classes on Lincoln, Medal of Honor. I applied for Women in History. Um, I think if the district uh, notified people about this, it could save our teachers some money. A musical, um, this Saturday from 10 to 3 is our first um, building of the set. All are welcome. You don't have to have any kind of uh, um, expertise. And please buy your tickets online on our website. TeenWorks, district promotion of this, I think, could help funding sources for clubs or individuals looking for community projects. TeenWorks is funded through United Way, and they've um, sponsored 500 youth community service projects. They are amazing, especially Boy Scouts. Meals, Dr. Serena, I was thinking about you on this one. USDA is proposing new nutrition standards for school meals. It would begin 2025. It would limit sugary desserts such as donuts to no more than twice a week at breakfast. It would reduce sodium in meals by 30%. But if you want to comment, public comments open until April, go to the USDA website. Family engagement, I was happy to see a framework developed recently. It would embed into our teacher prep courses ways to equip teachers with skills they need to be able to better work with families. Religious garb, this is the last one. Do you know that four things I have on right now are against school code and illegal for Pennsylvania teachers to wear? I have this on, I have my cross on, I have my necklace or my earring on, and my shirt says Jesus on it. We're the only state that has this old law. Even though it was ruled on the Constitution in 2003, and it's never enforced. Under threat of loss of job, teachers should can't wear any indicator of being an adherent to a religious denomination. This came about in 1894 when a court said nuns could teach in public school. The very next year, our state passed it because they feared Catholic indoctrination. Every other state would allow me to wear this outfit and I would not have to fear about losing my job. This is a bipartisan issue a bill to allow my cross necklace and things like this passed the PA Senate last month, 49 to zero. The state's teacher union wants to get rid of this old law. I was thinking that maybe the board members or together might want to write a letter um, to our state rep to try to get rid of this outdated unconstitutional law. Thank you. No, no, not necessary. 
Please bear with me. I am not a public speaker. Um, my name is Elizabeth Cancellari. I'm the mother of five children, and my family has just moved from Salkin School District. I am speaking with you tonight as a concerned parent of one of Liberty Bell Elementary's first graders. I want to highlight an important issue that I have deep concern regarding parent pickup dismissal security. I am sure how you remember less than a year ago, 19 children and two adults were killed in Texas. This was yet again another community that was met with the horror of a school shooting. We are again seeing our children running in terror from a place that next to their own homes should be the safest place that they go. Now, keeping the above in mind, when I went to pick up my child from parent pickup, I found myself shocked to the point of speechlessness about the fact that there was such a lack of security. After this revelation, I emailed her principal and pointed out the flaws that I saw. I received an argument back telling me that what I saw wasn't an accurate picture of the security members that are in place. So to ensure I wasn't jumping to conclusions, I went again and picked her up and saw the exact same flaws, but this time took pictures and recorded it as evidence pointing out that he lied to me in his responses. As a United States Marine, I am familiar with the security members, and I even suggested how after talking to other Southern Lehigh parents at different schools, Liberty Bell could adopt most of their procedures. After this, I have not received the response back, and I am willing to take whatever action is necessary within reason to ensure my daughter's safety as well as all the other children and staff. I have brought along with me the email chains along with the pictures that will not be shared outside of this room due to children and parents' confidentiality. I also have the video on my phone. What can be seen in these photos and the video are teachers that are not at the entrance and not at the exit and doors propped open. Nobody is ensuring that the person picking up the child is the designated person and three teachers that are present are standing in a circle talking to one another and none of them had radios. The district's top priority should be the safety, security and well-being of all students and staff. I realize as a parent that despite all the steps that we might take, we are not immune and must all remain vigilant. However, a general update to your safety and security procedures at this particular school must be taken. Now, everything I said should sound familiar to one of you here tonight because you received it in an email over a month ago and never responded until today when I sent another email to which you asked if we could speak on the phone. I am past the point of speaking and I want action done to protect my kids and everybody else's kids. This is ridiculous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Nice. 